Whatever the reasons that people become deniers, they often have an agenda which they won't admit to. Why do you continually denigrate the work of David Irving? You can have opinions about the Holocaust, but I won't meet with anyone who says the Holocaust didn't happen. We are here with the uh, Queen of Truth, Deborah Lipstadt, who wrote the uh, who wrote the book that inspired the new film Denial. And um, we're obviously going to be talking about a serious topic here in, in this interview, but I wanted to start off from from the film. Um, a little bit on the lighter side, you, you share a special bottle of wine with, uh, with your lawyer, played by Tom Wilkinson, in the film. And I thought that was an a, a interesting scene and a, and, a, and a good way to kind of start this talk because um, you, you walk with him at, at Auschwitz and you're not sure you really like him yet. You think he shows up late. You know, who is this guy? And, and in this scene, you find out he was actually, uh, he showed up early before you did. And um, he's, he's a serious man. Um, to, to, you know, as a nod to Joel and Ethan Cohen there. And it turns out in that, in that, in that meeting with that bottle of wine, you, uh, he's got feelings, uh, and you, you start to trust him in, in, this, in this trial. You know, uh, David Hare, when he wrote the screenplay, uh, needed a dramatic arc. Of course, every screenplay, it's, uh, you know that, it bring Coles to Newcastle to even say that, you know. But he needed a dramatic arc, and he couldn't use the David Irving as, character as a dramatic arc because David Irving was, as I like to say, a no good Nick before, during, and after. But part of the dramatic arc, and it's true, because I talk about it in the book from which the film was adapted, was my learning to trust the lawyers, my learning that I had to keep silent and accept that fact, um, and my learning to get to know Richard Rampton. And um, in the beginning, he struck me as very austere. I, I visited him in his uh, chambers as the um, movie shows, and there was his wig on a stand, and there were awards and pictures, and it was sort of musty. It's exactly as the setting is in the movie. And um, he struck me as very, very much, you know, sort of out of Masterpiece Theater, out of, you know, all those things, Rumple of the ba Old Bailey or something. The, he, was, he was a character. And then we get to Auschwitz, and um, at one point, you know, uh, Robert Jan van Pelt, our expert witness who was guiding us, said, let's walk the grounds to get a sense of the immensity. And he said, why? It's, this is not a memorializing trip, this is a forensics trip. You know, and Heather repeats that later. And I kept thinking, well, I know it's about law, but we're in the biggest killing field in the world. How can they be so without, what I thought was without feeling. I was completely wrong. Um, and getting to learn to trust him, getting to learn to have uh, complete confidence in him, and then in the end, he's, he's become a very close friend. We remain friends. I don't go to England anymore without seeing him. Um, he's a friend, he's a compatriot, and above all, he loves the movie. So. And, and, you know, you have a scene in there, too, where, where you, um, you know, you're doing a Jewish prayer, and, um, you know, you're, you're feeling that moment, whereas he's working, mm -hmm. you know, so it was kind of, it, was, it came from different angles there. You know, I think at that moment, and I was a little, it was that, when I did that prayer, it was after we had that interchange, that fight at, at Auschwitz, and I thought, well, maybe I shouldn't go and do it because I'll delay them and they'll be annoyed, and then I said, how can I be here and not, I'm a... I'm a believing person, and it's a memorial prayer. How can I be here and not do it? So I very quietly went over to the edge of the ruins of the gas chamber, and when I started to say it, I looked up uh, Professor von Pelt, whom I didn't know was Jewish, was standing there saying it with me. You know, he looks at it, he, he, he looks, and I often wonder what his look is conveying. I think it's conveying two things, which I didn't know then. One, we're working and they're praying. Um, I mean, even though it took all of, I don't know, three minutes or something like that. And also a deep, deep sense of feeling and respect. Um, but that was as it is. That was as it was. That building that relationship was a big part of the story. And there was also, there was a line in the film, um, and I've heard this in, in life too, and sometimes people, um, you know, when you talk about the Holocaust, like that, that's something that's infinite. And there's a line in the film where essentially whoever says it, it essentially kind of says like, it's been long enough, get over it. Yeah, the, the You know, right. and like, like you don't, you don't get it. You know, yeah. so how do you know when, you're, when your story is finished? Um, you know, I would never say, and I would be appalled that anyone would say to an African-American, enough with slavery, right. get over it. 
Um, or someone who would say to an Armenian, enough with the Armenian genocide, it was the beginning of the 20th century, get over it. It shapes who you are as a people. It can't be the only thing that shapes it. Um, I don't think the Holocaust should be the only thing that shapes someone's Jewish identity, because then you shape an identity that's of oppression, you know, and of what people do to you, and the same thing with slavery, the same thing with the Armenian genocide. But, you know, say to a rape victim, you know, or someone whose mother had been raped even, uh, come on, get over it. Uh, it's just, A, it's insensitive, and B, it's denying the reality of what happened to them. So there has to be a balance. Um, and uh, I think that, that plays out in that momentary scene in the, in the movie. And in the film, and in the trial, you know, because the film, the film, you know, one of the film's main tenets is about truth, and you wanted this to be completely true. And so at the trial, uh, David Irving is offended by the word denier. Yes. And, you know, was well, it a verbal yellow star? Right, a verbal yellow <laughs> star, right. And then we talk about holes, you know, no holes, no holocaust from that mm -hmm. scene, which was incredible. So your, so your lawyer, played by Tom Wilkinson, says, well, you're not just a denier, you're a liar. You're, mm -hmm. you're a historical fraud. Mm -hmm. You know, let's not just, you know, and David Irving is offended by a, being a denier, but... He is, he is. Look, the, the strategy, the legal strategy was fo as follows, and he says it. We're going to turn the spotlight on David Irving. And what we did is uh, follow the footnotes back to the sources. And what we found is whenever he said, you know, I have a document that proves there were no gas chambers, I have a document that proves Hitler tried to stop the Holocaust, or whatever it might be, when we looked at the original document, when we went back, you know, all the way to the original document, we found that it never said that. In fact, it said something, often said something the exact opposite, and is shown in that scene with Judentransport aus Berlin, Jewish crane from Berlin, which he turns in to stop all the, you know, don't, don't, don't kill the people on that train, Himmler says. And he turns it into Hitler ordered to stop the liquidation. You know, he turns one train from Berlin into a global thing. It's, it's a... Uh, a violation of evidence, it's a violation of truth, it's a violation of what historians do. Um, David Irving had never put himself in a situation where his work would be examined like that. And it wasn't like, it, all historians make mistakes. I publish a book, people comment, here you got this wrong, and the next edition I fix those mistakes. That wasn't this. This was deliberate mis- Re representation of what the facts showed. And the judge says it in the end. He says, no fair-thinking historian would ever doubt there were gas chambers at Auschwitz. No, uh, that, that David Irving's way of presenting the material is fallacious, it's lies, it's, it's misinterpreting, it's changing things, it can't be trusted, and that he does it deliberately. So by, by suing me, by his coming after me, and my saying, okay, you're going to sue me, I'm going to fight back. Um, and fight back with all my strength, and of course the law, having lawyers who did that, um, suddenly his work was under a spot, was examined in a way it hadn't been examined before. Um, and he, he, was, he was, as a, as a, a reliable uh, speaker of history, his, he was destroyed. And you chose to allow this case in London versus, in, versus the U.S., and it, and it switched the burden of proof I what? didn't choose. I was. That's but you're where, allowed. Uh, yeah, I was sued. I was. That's where I was sued. I had no choice. But this meant that you essentially had to prove the Holocaust happened versus essentially if it would have been in the U.S. You were essentially guilty until that's proven until innocent. proven innocent. That's exactly right. Um, if I hadn't fought him, if I hadn't challenged what he said, he would have won by default because the burden of proof is on the per on in America. If I say you libeled me. I have to prove you libeled me because you're innocent until proven guilty. In England, if I say you libeled me by what you wrote about me, you as the author have to prove the truth of what you said. So um, if I hadn't fought, he would have won by default. If he had won by default, then it would have been factual that you, he would have been able to say the court proves, the court found that Deborah Lipstadt libeled him by calling him a Holocaust denier. Ipso facto, therefore, he's not a Holocaust denier. And his version of the Holocaust, there was no plan to kill the Jews. Hitler was the best friend the Jews had in Germany. Um, the gas chambers are a fake. The Jews have made this all up. Would have found it to be true. Um, and I just couldn't fight that. There were people who said to me, ignore it. There were people who said to me, settle. There were people who said to me, you're wasting your time. He's like a flatter theorist. Who's going to believe him anyway? But I just felt that the assault on history was, was too great to let that happen. 
And there are, there are laws today about being a denier in many countries around the world, and especially in Germany. You know, there's, there, there are laws that, that say that if you are a denier, you know, there's one thing obviously about genocide, but, but being a denier in Germany now is, is a criminal offense. Right. In France, too, and a denier of genocide, Armenian genocide, Holocaust, it's not just the Holocaust, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, do you feel that, you know, is it, is it, is it a, a court of law's responsibility to make something like no, that? No, I think legal? it's, I'm, ironically, and someone described this as, my position on this as the ultimate uh, man bites dog story, because you would expect after what I went through that get those laws out there, put them in place so nobody has to go through this again. I'm against those laws. Um, first of all, I'm a believer in free speech. We have that pesky little thing called the First Amendment, which we all treasure, and I believe in it very strongly. Second of all, laws suggest that we don't have the documents, we don't have the proof to prove it. And in my case, the documents, you know, as my trial showed, the documents abound to prove every aspect of the Holocaust and to, to document it in detail. Third of all, and most importantly, I don't want to leave or cede to the politicians uh, authority over what can and cannot be said. I was recently in Germany, I was talking to a young man who was talking about uh, some of the Islamophobia and some of the torment that, that, that Europe has seen, the cartoon crisis in Denmark and other things. And he said, well, I think there should be rules that you can't insult another religion. And coming from a religion that is very often insulted, I said, I don't think so. And he looked at me strangely. I said, who's going to make the decision? This is OK, but this is not. This is acceptable, but this is, this is not acceptable. Um, and I just think such laws are dangerous. I think it's dangerous to give politicians authority over what can and cannot be said. And now for being such a, a staunch believer in free speech, you know, anyone who knows this, this book, knows this story, knows this trial, knows that you did not speak during the trial. And your lawyers advised you not to because you're not on trial. You, you were putting David Irving on trial. So, so we know you didn't speak, and we know how hard that is. We know that you, know, you don't have a filter, right? And so how, during the trial, how did, you, how did you go to sleep at night feeling genuine to, to what you were doing when you weren't speaking, they were speaking for you, and you woke up the next day and you have the Holocaust survivor at the trial who says, we need to speak, the dead need to have a voice, and you chose to trust lawyers and... I had to trust, you know, once I, I, I called on them to act for me, you know, as, as it's called, to represent me in England, um, there was, uh, I, I knew I had to trust them. And I, I figured out pretty quickly, maybe a little quicker than Rachel Weiss does, or the Deborah Lipstadt character as, as portrayed so well by Rachel Weiss, that, that these guys knew what they were doing. But it was very hard. She, what she shows is I did a lot of jogging, a lot of on, time on the treadmill when they told me, at one point they told me not to jog outside because of danger, et cetera, or, or just to be safe. Um, but it was very difficult. But, uh, you know, eyes on the prize. I knew that the, the, the victory we could achieve uh, was so important. And um, once he came to sue me, I was intent that, um, you know, I had to fight back.